So what am I doing here? Well, I think it started as a distraction when I was a little stumped on another project I've been working on. A question occurred to me. What's going on with Perl these days? It used to be my favorite programming language, and I wondered what it would be like to try to pick it back up after almost 20 years. I was curious how easy or challenging it might be. What does the ecosystem look like now? In this video, we'll talk a little bit about the history of Perl and my experiences with it. Then, I'll revisit it after 20 years by building a language model based on Markov chains to generate text. It's a baby step towards building a generative AI model. If you're worried this might be a video bashing Perl because you're a fan, don't worry, I'm a fan too. It's an important language and it continues to be used to do some amazing things. I'm not here to bash it, I'm here to appreciate it. When I started college, the teaching language had just switched from Pascal to Java, Java 1.2 to be specific. Other classes were offered in C, C++, Fortran, Visual Basic, and I took all of them. But when I had an opportunity to do an independent study, I made a choice that would open up my mind about what programming could be and how I thought about computing. I decided to do it in Perl. Throughout the rest of college and for the first part of my early career, it was my go-to language of choice. What is Perl? The name stands for Practical Extraction and Report Language, and it was invented by Larry Wall in 1987. It grew in popularity because it's easy to get a lot of things done with it. It's built on a flexible design principle with the motto of there's more than one way to do it. It became a mainstay of information technology infrastructure around the world, powering more scripts, programs, and even enterprise-level systems than I can begin to imagine. Compared to the heavy-handedness of Java and C, I found Perl's syntax liberating. It removed a lot of the unnecessary formality from programming. I found it powerful and flexible, too. You could build anything with it. I built an open-source desktop environment using just Perl TK, and later a speech recognition command and control application for Linux that gained some popularity among the accessibility community. I gave a talk at yet another Perl conference in 2002 and briefly met Larry Wall, Perl's founder. I was very active in the Perl community. I spent hours upon hours learning and sharing information. It was great to be a part of. But as you can see from my stream on Perl Monks, my activity in Perl usage died off in the early 2000s. I wasn't the only one either. So what happened? Well, for me at least, after college, I discovered Python and pretty quickly my side projects and work projects started shifting over. There are a lot of reasons that people select specific languages, and Python for me provided all the important parts that Perl did without some of the oddities. So Python became my go-to language of choice for the past 20 years. It looks like Strawberry Perl is a version of choice for Windows these days, and since I've been using Windows for video work lately, that's what I'll go with. I have it downloaded and installed in just a few minutes and can get out the simplest of Hello World programs before I need to turn to the internet for help. I needed an objective. What am I going to try to build in Perl that can give me a sense of what it's like to work with the language? So after a little thought, I landed on a text generator based on Markov chains and stochastic models. Okay, so let's talk about how they work. First, Markov chains. These are a simple way to model probabilities of a transition to a new state given the previous state. Let's start with a simple example, a common one used is modeling weather patterns. Using this model, you could make some predictions about what the next state is going to be given the previous state. If the current state is sunny, there's a 40% chance that the next state will also be sunny, but 50% of the times the next state will be cloudy. Only 10% of the times will sunny transition directly to rain, so very few times that it's sunny would you predict that the next state would be rain. This relationship between states can also be modeled in this matrix. There are many, many use cases of Markov chains to model state transition probabilities, but in this case we're going to use them to generate new text based on an example text we train on. To do this, we'll model the current state as the previous k words. Let's look at an example where k equals 1. Consider the text, there was fun and there was laughter. We might build a model of it like this. The word there transitions to the word was 100% of the times. The word was transitions to the word fun 50% of the times and to laughter 50% of the times. Laughter has no transitions, but fun transitions to the word and 100% of the time 
which in turn transitions to the word there 100% of the times. This is a very simple model describing transition probabilities for a very small text corpus. As the size of the training data grows, so does the complexity of the model that it takes to describe it, but the believability and diversity of the text it can generate also grows. Now we have a model, but how do we use it to generate text? In the simplest of approaches, we'll choose a random place in the graph and then trace random weighted probabilities at each node using the selected transition as the next text output. I've built these in the past for synthetic data generation, so I'm familiar with the approach and it feels like a natural fit for a practical extraction and reporting language. Plus, they are amazingly simple approaches to generative models and fun to play with. To make the output more convincing, we want to use n-gram transitions. That is, rather than modeling the probability of one word transitioning to a new word, we will use the probabilities that the n previous words transitions to a new word. To balance time and complexity, we're going to go with bigram transitions for this demo. Time to get started with the code. The first thing I needed was some training data, so I made a simple text file that would work to test the algorithm. Now we need to read it off of disk, so I refreshed my memory on how to do this and came up with this function. This is a great place to start talking about some of the interesting concepts in Perl. Subroutines in Perl don't have signatures. Instead, arguments are passed to the sub in the special variable at underscore. In the first line, we're simply assigning it to the variable fname. On the second line, we're making a new empty array. The pattern in Perl is that scalar variables, like integers or strings, are noted using the dollar sign and array variables use the at sign. The next bit iterates through the file line by line. The current line read is put into the dollar sign underscore magic variable, which is used a lot in Perl. I'd forgotten all about the magic variables in Perl. They remove a lot of unnecessary code, but can also make it less readable to novices. I need to brush up on my Perlisms. So now we need to train an ngram model on the text. This is basically the step where we parse the input line and turn it into a sparse matrix of states and transitions. In these first lines, I'm using one of the best features of Perl. It's super powerful regular expression engine to normalize the text by replacing weird quotes with normal ones and then inserting spaces between common punctuation. I want to treat the punctuation as though it were a normal word so that it is also part of our generative model. The primary data structure we're going to use is the built-in hash or associative array. In Python, they're called dictionaries, and in both languages, they form the basis of all objects. One really difficult thing was for me to remember that hash elements in Perl are accessed using curly braces instead of square braces, like in Python. I remember that using square brackets in Python was difficult for me after using Perl, and now I'm having problems going in the opposite direction. The output of this training function is a hash that stores the n-grams and the count of each transition that occurred within the training text. Next, I wrote a new sub to iterate through the hash and print a representation. Here is the output of the test training example, the first two elements being the bigram and the next being the transition, followed by a count of occurrence observed in the text. To complete the training of the model, we need to turn this into a sparse matrix of bigrams and their weighted transition probabilities. In the first loop here, I'm setting up the transition matrix by creating an entry for each bigram and then adding each transition state as a member hash. In the second loop, I'm iterating through each hash key, and for each element, I'm setting up parallel arrays, one to hold the transitions and one to hold the weights, or probability, of each transition. Then, I iterate through each transition and calculate its percent chance based on its occurrence count divided by the total count of this bigram state. This introduces another great concept from Perl, the unless statement. It's the same as an if statement, but inverse to provide readability for negative conditional tests. The idea is that an if not condition statement can be more difficult to grok than an unless condition statement. It's part of the more than one way to do it philosophy. So now we have a transition matrix that models the input training text. I wrote this function to print it out. A super productive callout about Perl is the automatic interpolation of variables into output strings. This is where the reporting part of Perl really shines. It's extremely easy to format output without concatenation or string building. Here's a sample output. 
For each bigram, there's a total count and a set of observed transitions with their calculated probabilities. This is the final model that we'll use to generate text. Now for generating text from the model. This is actually a pretty simple part of the process. The first couple of lines get the subroutine arguments into variables. Then I select a random state from the model to be our starting point. This is our seed. Next, we call a sub named getWeightedTransition and pass in the previous two words or bigram. In getWeightedTransition, if there is no transition for this bigram, I return null. Otherwise, we call a function that will pick one of the possible transitions based on random weights. The higher the probability of a transition, the higher its probability of being selected as our next word. Back in the main generation function, the newly selected transition is added to the text and the new bigram is composed. If no transition is returned, a new random state selection is made. This process goes on until the requested word count is hit. Finally, we do a little code cleanup and normalization on the output text, and we're ready to see how the whole thing performs. First, let's look at the simple training text that I made for testing out the algorithm. There isn't a lot of input text here, so the output doesn't have a lot of diversity. There's a few original phrases in there, but much of it is direct repeats from the training corpus. The best way to diversify our output is to increase the size of the training text. Since we've gone down a rabbit hole here, I'm going to train it on the first few chapters of Alice in Wonderland. This is a lot better. You can see more diversity here, and it has a Lewis Carroll feel for sure. But when I try it on a longer selection, this time Walden, I notice a problem. It's really, really slow at the text generation part. I did some quick calculations and saw that training on the longer text was scaling linearly, but generation was not. This isn't what I would have expected, so I must be doing something wrong. To find out what's taking up all the time, I need to learn what kind of profiling tools are available for Perl these days. Most resources point me towards a tool called Devel NYT Prof. After only a few minutes, I get the module installed and make a profiling run. There's a tool to output HTML of the runtime, and it all works really smoothly. It looks a little dated, but it's actually super useful in zooming in on where the problem is. Looking at the profiler output, it's pretty easy to see what's going on here. I was inadvertently making a copy of the matrix in each call when I was reading in the function arguments. What I needed to do was pass a reference to the hash and then work on the reference in the function. This change results in a drastic performance boost, dropping the runtime of this function from 7 seconds to 3 milliseconds. This is where Perl and Python have a huge difference. Perl function calls are strictly passed by reference, and arguments are really just flat list of scalars. This means you have to put a bit of thought into referencing and dereferencing arguments, or you'll get some unexpected results. In this case, I just didn't completely think it through what I was doing, and that was causing my program to take orders of magnitude longer to run than it should have. Python, on the other hand, is neither passed by value nor by reference. Instead, it uses a passed by object reference approach, where immutable objects like strings, numbers, and tuples behave like they were passed by value, and mutable objects like lists, dictionaries, and sets behave like they were passed by reference. This language convention isn't limiting, and it keeps Python function arguments simplified and generally avoids the mistakes that I was making with argument handling. It's time to do a little code cleanup and refactoring so it can be ran from the command line. I let the user specify command line options for the training file name and optionally the output word count and verbosity levels. This refactoring leads me to find several other places in the code where function arguments or local variables weren't working exactly the way I expected. A good Perl programmer would probably show me hundreds of ways this could be optimized, but it works fairly well for my purposes. I've put the code on GitHub so you can take a closer look if you want. I'll put the repo link in the description. This is only the starting point to an effective generative model, and there are a number of ways to easily improve this generation, but it's pretty amazing that around 200 lines of Perl code can provide this level of a starting point. The text output doesn't stand up to scrutiny, but the more text you give it, the greater variation of the output and the more convincing it'll be. You can see that the output changes based on the training set, and if we mix different sources together, we start getting even more variation in the output.
This rabbit hole has been a lot of fun and brought back quite a bit of nostalgia for me. All of the reasons I migrated to Python 20 years ago are still valid today. It just fits my middle model better. But Perl is an extremely powerful language and has a vibrant and helpful community. I recommend folks take a look, try it out. It'll give you a new way of thinking about the bits you're trying to manipulate, if nothing else. Thanks for watching.